506 CT is when Travis Scott arrived at Raw. Now look, I get it, he's Travis Scott. He was a special guest of the WWE. What's next? Oh, it's 402, here comes Larry the Janner. Oh man, it's 709, here comes Jane, the kitchen attendant. I mean, seriously, man, I don't need to know when everybody arrives at a wrestling show. But secretly, I don't care. Just makes me laugh. Also, hello, my friends. My name is Simon Miller. Welcome to Ups and Downs, the wrestling review show where you have to deal with all my opinions and you've got to deal with my bald head. And you're like, Simon, why are you always talking about these things? But that's what everybody always talks to me about. You don't think I've been through enough with losing my damn hair? Of course I have. Let's get into sports entertainment and up those downs. Otherwise, Drew McIntyre kicked off Raw. He is not happy with Seth Rollins. Because he thinks Seth is selfish, delusional, and a massive hypocrite. Because now, look, he's got two matches at WrestleMania. Because this dude is totally obsessed with the spotlight. He then made me laugh because the crowd was wanting him. So he just went, well, well, say what if you're happy that I took out CM Punk. Some people actually said it. When he started talking about The Rock and the history of pro wrestling. And how all the things come together. And essentially how Seth Rollins is an absolute idiot. Now at this point, Drew McIntyre had said his name so many times, out did come Seth. He was like, Ugh, why don't you claim more of me again, like you did last week? And he was so desperate for this, he even turned his back to Drew McIntyre. I was like, Rollins, what the flub are you doing? Drew disagreed with everything that he was coming out of his mouth, because once again, it's all Rollins' fault, because he has to start focusing on this world heavyweight title. I mean, look at him, the Scottish warrior. Sure, he could be mad that Sola Sokoa and Jimmy Uso got involved in his matches, but he's not, because his eyes is on the prize. Screw the bloodline. When it comes to Seth, though, once again, he's just totally into himself and nothing else. This is when Drew mimicked his laugh. You know the one. <laughs> Once again, that was quite funny. So the comeback to all of this is that McIntyre and CM Punk have one thing in common, that they are both massive hypocrites, to the point he knows that if the Bloodline did get involved in their WrestleMania match and Drew walked away as the champion, he wouldn't actually care at all. In fact, at this juncture, he may as well be an honorary member of the Dad Club. Thankfully, Seth and Cody are finally going to defeat those guys at WrestleMania night one, so on night two, they can fight for this belt properly, which of course Seth will win. And McIntyre kind of ignored all of this. He was like, oh, I know what you're doing. You want me to attack you, but I'm not going to do this. And he left. So I really do think he has to win the championship, and I'll be honest with you, this didn't really have the fire under it that I was expecting, but that could be because for the last like 12 weeks, we have had fire promos for everyone. The streak has to end. It was still good though, and it got me excited for this match. And once again, I'm just gonna lay it out as clear as day. Drew McIntyre should win this match, maybe because of Bloodline shenanigans, because of course, if we are talking about that tag team match at WrestleMania night one, yeah, the Rock and Roman Reigns should win. Different video, different day. Don't do this with your hand up. Damage Control then arrived at the building and I was like, oh my God, stop telling me people have arrived at the buildings. When we had this video with Chad Gable for the Gauntlet match later, my word, that was good. He has to win, and he's doing it for his family. When we got to our first match, Becky Lynch, versus Liv Morgan. They had fallen out last week, so of course Morgan smashed her with some dies before Becky came back with some exploders. Like all wrestlers though, eventually just, just threw herself at Morgan. She got code breaker right in the face. I mean, where else? Immediately this started a little slow too, and all of a sudden we got the sunset bomb to the outside and it really picked up. And when Liv Morgan was gonna go for Oblivion, she got hit with the manhandle slam, but she had a plan for this. It was a nice and simple one, she rolled out the ring. She surely must have taken a med pack when she was out there as well, because when she got back in the squared circle, Becky went for the arm bar, and Liv just smashed her with a tornado DDT. She followed up with Oblivion, but this time Becky Lynch had learned her lesson as she rolled out of the ring. And then these two were just full on copy and paste, because Morgan just threw herself into Becky Lynch. She hit the manhandle slam, one, two, three, done. Bex the whole time too was acting like she was in WrestleMania mode because he's super focused now, and she's gonna have to be, because as soon as this did end, who arrived? Flabbing Rhea Ripley. Now she sort of praised Lynch for doing all of this because she continues to fight even though she's going to go for the championship at WrestleMania. But she understands why Becky does have to do this because in her head, she's trying to convince herself she is the best. But because Rhea exists, she's not. It's also going to be a fine excuse come that Raw after Mania. She can be like, oh, I had too many fights before the show of shows. But Rhea Ripley is firing those shots. This just sent Becky mad though. And I swear she said something like, it could be me versus the world and I'd still win. I've been thinking about this. I'm like, okay, well, you either mean you're going to fight 7 billion people. I don't think you're going to win there, Lynch. Or you mean you're going to fight the entire planet known as Earth. Look, I did a quick Google about this thing. It pretty big. I think you're going to do it. These two just have great chemistry, though. And there are a contingent of people who are like, man, this doesn't feel like a big deal. You're all totally nuts. 
this is one of my most anticipated WrestleMania matches, and I still think Rhea Ripley could win, because that opens the door for a whole brand new story. Give it a nap. When Nick Aldis and Adam Pearce lost their damn minds, because they had been discussing what to do with the tag team titles, and came up with the idea of taking the Judgment Day and putting them in a six-pack ladder match. That means there's going to be six teams, which also means, watch, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's right. 12 people in a ladder match? That is totally flabbing ridiculous. Really nobody told Damien Priest and Finn Balor either as we cut to them. They were like, the hell is going on here? So they went to talk to the GMs, and I think I figured this one out, because the rumor for ages has been that WWE wants to split the tag team titles up again, one set on Raw and one set on SmackDown. So as they will all be hanging from the sky, one team can grab one, one team can grab the other, and then we just go shrug emoji, take it in Mondays and Fridays. This is going to be mad though, and let's face it, if we do do what we usually do at these shows, very well be the highlight of WrestleMania. When we got our controversial segment of the evening, great. But it was Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell taking on Ivy Nile and Maxine Dupree. And look, shows what I know, turns out all those hints seven days ago weren't true. We are most definitely turning Candice heel. Because essentially though, when Maxine went for her version of the Caterpillar, Lorraine got right in her face and was like, man, you're trying to pull that ship on us? You are a disgrace. You don't belong in the ring. No wonder the fans boo you. No wonder everybody thinks you suck and you think it's bad out here. You should hear what we say about you in the women's locker room. I was like, yeah. all right, Candice, calm down. You're being really mean. The line that really set people off, though, is that Candice finishes off by saying, you should be glad your brother is dead because he would be ashamed of you. And I was like, man. Somebody has definitely rang up Christian Cage. Dupree was then gonna leave when Indy Hartwell booted her in the face and she was acting all shocked here. When they got rid of Ivy Nile, and Candice was like, you better pin her and you better pin her right now. So they did. So there is your brand new finishing move that everyone should use. Totally destroy someone emotionally and combo that by kicking them in the skull. So here is the deal and it's nothing new from me or ups and downs. I said every single time, as long as Maxine herself was totally fine with this, then I'm totally fine with it too. If something has happened in her personal life, she's like, yeah, man, let's use it as a story, then we shouldn't be allowed to complain. They are her tragedies or her feelings or her thoughts, whatever it may be, she's allowed to make that choice. I also find it a little bit odd because there is some outrage here from the same people who are like a Christian when he goes after people's fathers. It's so funny. You've got to pick a lane, man. You can't choose one or the other. Also, do you think Candice LeRae came up with this? Of course she didn't. It must have come from the mind of Maxine Dupree. And if it's going to help her on a professional wrestling journey, well, I've already told you, I'm totally cool with it. Also, at least in terms of a women's tag team match, we got some story and we got some narrative and the titles aren't even involved. I'm sorry, if you look at the past couple of years, that is a massive step forward. I'm here for it. Now I do admit I'm not sure turning Candice the right bad guy is the best thing to do because he's such a good baby face. But as I always tell you, sometimes we've got to swing for the fences and see what happens. So I'm actually quite intrigued to see where this does go. I like Maxine Dupree. Listen, she's not the best version of what she is going to be and she certainly is learning on the job. I just like seeing people try and they fail and try and they fail and they try, 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 fail, fail, fail. But eventually she will succeed and that will just make it all the sweeter still. All I will say as well is just go to one professional wrestling training session, then you see how hard this stuff is. I'm giving it up, like I say, I want to see what's next. Judgment Day were then yelling at Adam Pearce and Nick Aldis, especially Finn Balor. He was like, you know I don't like ladders, how could you? Adam tried to spin this too by saying, well, you can cement your legacy. And he's like, what are you talking about? We've been champions for ages, we've already done that makes a good point. The absolute best part is Damo then demanded to know where this idea had come from. And even though both GMs were like, nope, we're not telling you, man, never put them under interrogation because they cracked instantly and it actually came from the minds of The Miz and R-Truth. Priest was so mad about this, he wanted to fight R-Truth right now, but Pierce was like, look, he's not here, he's doing media. When Truth just walked in the room, I was dying, I tell you, I love him. As always though, it turns out that he got completely the wrong day. He didn't realize it was Monday, but this worked out for Damien Priest, because later he shall now take on our truth. I'm just gonna give you four words, my friend. Goofy wrestling for life. We then got reminded of everything that had gone down on Smackdown. It was time for the big interview of the evening. Here came Cody Rhodes. He was sitting down to discuss all this with Michael Cole, and he just said it instantly. Listen. Not 100% sure if The Rock is my boss, but man, it felt good to slap him. He also said that Rocky had always been one of his favorites because he is a wrestler's wrestler, which means he knows exactly what this is. It's called.
sold a receipt. Michael Cole then essentially became disgruntled internet user number eight because he went after Cody. But I really enjoyed this segment because he was asking all the questions we've been asking. Damn it, we need answers. For example, why would Cody risk his match with Roman Reigns by having this tag match on Mania Night 1? And also, when it comes to Seth Rollins, how the flub can you trust that guy? Now, he used examples about how people change and even said to Michael, you used to be in a box-like structure depending to be an asshole, and you've changed. And also, I left the company, I smashed the throne, and then I came back to this place, and now I'm best buds with the person that sits in that damn chair. Yes, in case you missed it, he was talking about Triple H. He also even found a way to team with Jey Uso, who essentially screwed him over at WrestleMania 39. And that's where Seth comes into this too. Because when they do win that tag team match, it means when we get to that main event at WrestleMania Night 2, finally, finally, it can be a fair fight. Cody then spoke about his story, which of course is the law nowadays, but mentioned it's not just about him anymore, because there are so many other people he is fighting for, like a big fan of his, Hannah, who came to the wrestling show, even though she's blind, because she just wanted to fill the atmosphere. Also talked about another person called Harley, who had spinal surgery, and all the other members of his family that The Rock hadn't dared to mention, and the fact that he can never give this championship to Dusty Rhodes, because he's not here anymore, but he does have one parent left, and he can give it to his mother instead. By this point, he was all emotional, and I was too. I was like, man, Cody, which wall should I run through? I'll do it now. Brandy Rhodes also got a mention here because she's been with him the entire way, and that's why he has to win this title for every single one of those people. Damn it, Cody. You've done it again. He has to win at WrestleMania. He also looked right in the camera and he told Roman Reigns this is the final inning when he also said, Cole, don't worry. Soon you will be calling me the champion when he actually hugged him too. I can't remember if I said this, but I'm saying it again. Cody Rhodes is the best damn baby face. So you really should see this because just when you don't think you can get more behind the guy, WWE finds a way to do it. And like I say, when he does win this title, he is going to enter another stratosphere I don't think I could love him any more if I tried. It's a weird thing to say, but I also mean it. It is absolutely getting it up. For some reason, we then saw Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan shaking hands when Nia Jax must be on the Starship Enterprise. She was like, teleport me in there now, because she came from nowhere and went, bah, and just shouted, and she beat them all up, and she threw them through some tables. Now, this was going to tie to later, because Becky looked at the camera and said, I challenge you to a last woman standing match next week. That makes sense. You can win that, then finally move on. WrestleMania. Point at the side. When it was time for the women's tag team title match, Shayna Baszler and Zoe start taking on the Kabuki Warriors. And as we did predict, Shayna and Zoe lost. Let's. Now this is fine because I don't think Oscar and Kyrie Sane should be losing at this point either. But I'm just a bit worried what we do do with Shayna and Zoe now. I feel like WWE has any plans. Well, it was pretty good though because as soon as the bell rang, Stark just went, oh hey Oscar, and booted her right in the face. When she then just turned to Kyrie Sane, she gave her the Z360. She was cooking. Baszler then also hit the running knee and they would have had the one, two, three if it wasn't for those meddling kids. Or Oscar, she broke it up at the one, two, ooh. Shane was so mad about this though, she just locked in the Kira Fuda clutch. When I noticed the damage control were at ringside and do you know what Dakota Kai did? She grabbed her leg. No wrestler can handle that. I mean, it's dangerous if there's like an insect buzzing around because a fly could be hitting your face. You'd be like, oh, what's happening? And you let go of the moon. And of course, counted as a distraction though, so Oscar booted her right in the jaw when Kyrie came off with the insane elbow and they won they are still your tag team champions now i would somehow split zoe stark and shayna baszler up as long as we have proper singles plans for both of them which i don't think we do and yes like i've already talked about making sure the kabuki warriors do have a good run is important but at least these titles are being featured on tv now and i actually thought this was quite an entertaining match i'm gonna give it an up we were then back to teasing andrade in the judgment day after this because he was looking for Dominic Mysterio when Rhea Ripley turned up. She's like, good day, mate. He's not here. But when he is back, maybe we should talk some business. Andrade also seemed pleased with this, as did Finn Balor. He was like, oh, man, that Andrade, he's pretty good. And while Damian Priest didn't really care because he wants to focus on WrestleMania, something is going on here. If I was going to predict something, I think it's going to be Andrade versus the condom at WrestleMania. Who saw that coming? We then got more videos for the Gauntlet match as we continued to build that up when it was time for Damien Priest versus R-Truth. And R-Truth lost. Damo just jumped him instantly too, which actually summoned DIY because they came to the ring. Because you know the deal. They love R-Truth now and they want to be his friend. It actually worked though because Truth then flattened Priest with a flatliner when all of a sudden he started to do the John Cena comeback and he locked in the STF. And I'm going to admit that I was part of this crew. Everybody in the crowd was like, oh my gosh, Damien Priest is going to lose. And R-Truth is going to win. When, of course, JD McDonough and Finn Balor turned up. 
he started to attack Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. And as soon as our truth knew this, being the good friend that he is, he dived onto all of them. But what did I just tell you? If any kind of distractions happens in wrestling, people forget they're actually in matches. It just meant that he'd given Damien all the time, so he restored his MP, he hit his big old choke slam, and he got the one, two, three. And that rhymed, that must have been the right move. Bella and Madonna made sure they finished off DIY after this as well. I mean, they beat them up, they didn't eat them for dinner or anything. You'd have to figure that every single person here is gonna be in that ladder match. But look, I like all this. As long as our truth and the Miz do grab one set of those titles, just want to be happy sometimes. It's the point of wrestling. This was fun though. Um, There's a bunch of wrestling folk that had gone to the UFC event last weekend when we saw Rhea Ripley with Buddy Matthews. A man, WWE, did not want to identify that guy, so we jumped off to something else. We then had some more build for our Gortner match, but before that, he came damn Jey Uso. Now he made a very good point here, because he was like, listen, I came to Raw to try and have a bit of a reset, but do you know who keeps stop that from happening? It's none other than Jimmy Uso. Man, that is very true. The amount of championships he's cost. Therefore, though, we just have to sort it at duh, 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 WrestleMania point of the sign. He then pushed this hard because he said it's going to be brother versus brother, twin versus twin, or blood versus blood. And he ended it with Jimmy versus Jay. I was like, that doesn't have the same gravitas to it. Damn it, Jay, you should have done it the other way around. That was kind of it as well. This went really fast. But actually, it helped Jay Uso because it was like he was a man with a plan, and every single person in this building is right behind him. And I tell you, if we do treat this right over the next couple of weeks, this could be an amazing match at WrestleMania. And of course, we've been teasing it for ages. So I am going to give it an up. But yeah, it's time to get in the kitchen. We need some eggs. Then in a quick interview with Gunther, who was basically saying, hey man, I've held the title for 640 days. And that's why all of these people are about to do this Gauntlet match. They all want a piece of me and they want to stop my legacy. True. He also wished the winner luck. I'm just going to ruin your day here. I do apologize. I don't think he meant it. Which of course meant we got into our big old gauntlet match for the main event. And in case you're interested in this, I think it went about 41 minutes. Damn. We also began with JD McDonough taking on Ricochet, which is such a good plan, because these two just went totally crazy. And I swear at one point they went Brain Buster, Poison Rana, and Spanish Fly for a one 2 oo So the crazy on the internet going, oh, it's such an indie wrestling match. Why is that a bad term? What has happened to people? Ricochet then hit a DVD onto the apron, which is the hardest part of the ring, when he went suplex crazy. When JD McDonald just went, nah, and he raked his eyes. Give me more of that. It's a move that makes me chuckle. He also chucked him into the ring post. So I was like, oh man, Ricochet is totally screwed. But that's not true, because essentially he shook that off like he was Taylor Swift. He went to the top of the turnbuckle. He hit the shooting star press and he got the win. Now, all things considered, we should have done this. Ricochet had not had a match for ages. He had to get one win here. Um, it did actually have some fallout, though, because Bronson Reed then marched to the ring. And even though Ricky went dive, 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 Bronson was like, I know you're injured. I saw what happened, and he took advantage. It really did cost him as well, because at one point, mid-leap, Reed just grabbed him. He slammed him into the floor. When he hit the tsunami, and he beat him. Once again, I enjoyed the position between these two matches. First one went pretty long. This one didn't go long at all. And it made Bronson Reed feel like a big man. The slap man meat up. Same was it at number three. And of course, the crowd came alive for this. Especially because the bell went ding, ding. He did a moonsault off Barry Barricade. Damn. Sadly, the commercial break cost him, though. Because when we came back from that, Sammy was being beaten up. So we have to figure this out. And it was so damn easy. I bet Reed went to him. Oh, hey, Sammy. Did you see that Cody Rhodes supported Chad Gable on Twitter when it came to this match? And he's meant to be your pal. And it is true. That is what Cody did. The Sam probably got on his phone and was like, oh man, smacked in the face. That'll do. Bronson then decided he's going to climb the ropes though, because he is a crazy tamale. But Sammy Zayn had a plan from this, because he went up there too, and man, he turned it into this, I suppose, avalanche sunset flip power bomb, and he got the one, two, three. And even if the rest of the match had sucked, which it didn't, that was such a good finish. Get it up. It also led to Jeopardy because Shinsuke Nakamura then made his entrance. Bronson was so mad, he beat the flub out of Sami Zayn. It really did set up a great tease though, because Nakamura went straight for the Kinsasha, and somehow Sami turned that into the most devastating move in all the sports entertainment surprise roll up. Where they got a one two, and he followed it up with the least devastating move in all the sports entertainment, the Blue Thunderbomb. Did it work? Of course it didn't. It never does. Sucks. What really got me though is at one point Shinsuke went for a flying nothing and he totally missed it. I was like, what is going on with this show? Everybody's doing it. It absolutely worked though because Sammy was able to hit right trigger and he did the dodge when he hit the halluva kick and he got the one, two, three. 
he's only got one match to go. It's really smart as well because, of course, the last guy was Chad Gable. So this engaged your emotional gland. It was a pickle. Chad is such a good guy. He was all like, Sammy, get to your feet before we do start fighting. I was like, what are you doing? One, he's already been beaten up by like 97 people. And two, it's a gauntlet match. That's the whole point. It's not like he cared either. Because instantly hit him with all the German suplexes. Versus the Iron Lugan trick man. For some reason, Gable then decided it would be a great idea to apply the ankle log on the outside of the ring. And Zayn was like, nah, I don't want this. So he booted him right into rear the ring post. I was like, so much for sportsmanship. We then got this crazy exploder as Chad Gable went for a moonsault and Sammy got the knees up. And because this was wrestling tennis, they were going back and forth. They just kept slapping each other. And honestly, I could have called this one. If you put a gun to my head, you'd have to have killed me. I didn't know. Then I kind of regret that. Why didn't I just make a guess? At this point, two Gable was going ankle lock crazy to the point Sami Zayn had a limp. When he tried to hit the halluva kick, he couldn't do it. He didn't have a leg. It just meant that Chad Gable went right back into the submissions. Even when Sam got out that, he got German suplexed. And even when he was able to finally hit the halluva kick, he wasn't able to make the pin properly. Because once again, he was a wounded warrior. Then you were like, oh no, what's he going to do? It was so cool too, because when he finally went for the cover, Chad turned that into the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. I mean, it only got a one, two, ooh, but I totally bought it. We then went mega tease because Chad dropped the singlet strap, which means he is serious to this point. And even though he did apply the ankle lock and Sami Zayn was screaming from nowhere, he turned it into the surprise roll up and he got the one, two, three. It made me pop out of my chair. Mission accomplished. Now there is some online chatter that maybe Chad Gable's shoulders weren't properly down, but I don't think that is going to tie into the story. And even if it does, one, we're going to get Chad Gable versus Sami Zayn versus Gunther, fine by me. Or we're getting Gunther versus Sami Zayn. So I can't lose. I win. It is getting it up once again. Mostly for that finish. It was so well done. Chad and Sammy also hugged after this to let you know there is no hard feelings and Gunther walked out to look at Sami Zayn. You know the deal. When somebody looks to you at professional wrestling, things just got really serious. I really do like the fact that we have given Sammy this spot though because don't forget what happened last year, which is when I turned my attention to my counters. They're over there now, aren't they? It's all ups and there's no down. Probably a little bit unfair, but when I go through every single segment, I think to myself, well, what was WWE trying to achieve? And every time I think they at least did a passable job, the Raw overall gets an up. It doesn't mean it's like the best show ever. I've just had a good time. I hate me too. Now, of course, please do click the video on the screen, which is ups and downs for AEW Collision, so you can get all my thoughts on professional wrestling. Leave a comment below, like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Otherwise, you have a lovely day, my friends.